Hi guys, Dr. Dillard again. Let's finish off our Wednesday spinal anatomy lecture. It's a little bit longer one. And yeah, here we go. Last time we were talking about the sacral canal and we talked about the cauda equina and how it hung. There's the cauda equina right here, right? It's like horse's tail. Those are traversing nerve roots. We talked about the phylum terminale interna. Uh, which is a cord that comes off the conus medullaris. We'll talk more about that <clears throat> a little later on. Actually, I tell you right now, what's this is made of? It has pia mater wrapped around it. But if anyone's ever wondered, how come there's only a CX1? And I think I told you this. Uh, there's four seg segments. How come there's not at least three of these things? Well, the embryological remnants of those spinal nerves are actually inside of this. Uh, of this structure, ter phylum terminale. Once it pops out of the bottom of the thecal sac, it becomes the phyla terminale externa. Okay, you can also see there's the end of the thecal sac. The thecal sac ends at the S2 level, and therefore, life after the thecal sac. I really like this question, and a good board question for medical and chiropractic and physical therapy. We need to know what comes out of the thecal sac. What life after the thecal sac? So there's the line. S3, S4, S5 nerve roots all come out, traversing nerve roots, become exiting nerve roots once they go through here. Uh, and then we have the CX1. Where's CX2? There is no CX2. Right? So that's life after the after the thecal sac. And, of course, phylum terminale externa is right here. Uh, that also comes out and goes down, attaches to the first or second coccygeal dorsal part, right? And this is a dorsal cutaway, right? Maybe the the arch of the, the sacral arch has been removed, the vertebral arch has been removed, so the sacral tubercles, median sacral crest is gone, and the intermediate sacral crest is gone, the lamina are gone, and we can see quite nicely what the uh, what the the canal here looks like. All right, got everything. All right. So through this in here, we're not now. Traditionally, we let the lab professor talk about the muscles and teach you those muscles, and she should be synced up with gross anatomy one. Uh, so I just wanted to say that the erector spinae; those are those big furrow there's a furrow in, in the big mounds in each side in your low back uh, those collectively are called the rector spinae group and who are the rector spinae muscles the mnemonic i love spaghetti uh, works really good for that so the f the one most lateral is i iliocostalis lumborum there's iliocostalis thoracis depending or iliocostalis cervicis depends what region they're in uh, there, I love longissimus thoracis, longissimus cervicis, but for our purposes, just spine, just iliocostalis, spinalis, and or sorry, longissimus, and then spaghetti is spinalis. That one's interesting because if I was writing a question, I'd be careful about the origin. Is that one? Is it or is not part of the lumbar spine? Well, it arises, we believe, mostly from L1. So typically, it is technically part of the lumbar spine. All right, I love spaghetti. Probably the most, you've heard of the core, strength in the core. Who is the core? This is the most important core muscle, the multifidi muscle. Uh, it spans between one segment, like L4 and L5, and another. some other fibers span two segments, and other ones maybe three segments. So it's a multifaceted type muscle. It's called the multifidi. It connects to the sacrum. We're going to see in the next slide where it connects. That's your core. <clears throat> That's You can do bird dogs to strengthen that. And if you could have your patients do one exercise, that is the one to strengthen. Okay, quadratus lumborum is out here. People talk a lot about that. I really don't think that's that super important of a muscle clinically. Uh, you'll learn a lot about it, but it's not a super lot of research, in my opinion, quality research about it. But there is about the multi. It's it multifidized. There's quite a bit of good research about that. That's definitely people with chronic back pain actually have a quite dysfunctional multifidized muscle. But I let the upper corridors talk about that. 
So the reason I told you that is because we need to show you some attachments. We're working on the posterior sacrum, or we did in the last lecture. Uh, so the multifidi, where does it connect? So the caudalmost fibers, or the inferiormost fibers, uh, they collect, they plug in uh, to the back of the sacrum, where specifically between the median and the lateral sacral crest. So they basically cover the intermediate sacral crest, and they cover the IVFs here, or the posterior sacral foramen as well. And then there's another covering on top of them. So the rector spinae, not the meat of the muscle, but kind of the tendinous thing we call an aponeurosa, that connects over the top of them about the same place. Also connects between the median sacral crest and lateral sacral crest. So it kind of covers uh, the multifidi insertion. Who else? Gluteus maximus also attaches to the sacrum a little bit. You can see its attachment site right down here uh, on S3 and S4, the lateral part over the lateral sacral crest. And let's talk about the lateral part, the lateral view of the sacrum. We haven't talked about that. It's really important because that's what makes up the sacroiliac joint, which is a joint we treat a lot as chiropractors and physical therapists. And Yeah, you can even need fusion of the SI joint in rare cases. It can be a chronic uh, source of pain. Not that often, though. But let's see what we got here. So uh, we have an auricular surface. There's an auricular surface of the sacrum, lateral part we'll look at, and coxal bones. There's a lateral or there's an auricular surface of the ilium that you already know. And then there's a series of hills and valleys that are, that make up the surface of those auricular surfaces. Uh, and they match. A hill on the ilium make, matches the, ma, ma, the valley on the sacrum. So they match together and therefore the SI, the sacrum and ilium, auricular surfaces, or in other words, the sacroiliac joint, it locks together really strong and there's very little movement in the sacroiliac joint despite what <clears throat> we were taught a long time ago. It doesn't move very much as we'll see. So only a couple millimeters, two millimeters of notational, uh, notational motion. We'll look at that a little bit more in a bit. But here's a cartoon, kind of a topographical map of the auricular surface of the sacrum. So it's got a mountain here, and it's got a valley here. Bonier's tubercle actually fits in there. And then it's got another mountain here. These are really hard to see on the specimens. Uh, so the younger you are, the flatter this is. In young people, it's almost completely flat. And that's probably why they have a little more movement in their SI joints. And women, it's flatter. As you get older, especially in guys, these, these mountain ranges get taller, the valley gets deeper, and it can really lock in case it, uh, in fact, it ossifies in many people. All right, but that's kind of the, the deal with that. And if we bring in, here's the, let me see, did I turn on my drawing tools? I did, I didn't even know there's a yellow, but there is a yellow. Uh, but here, here's the ilium, right? You've already studied this bone, right? There's the kind of an L shape or an ear shape. There's the auricular surface of the ilium. That mates. These guys are mates. They, they go together perfectly and they connect. But the point is, the hill right here, there's a valley, a slight valley here on the ilium and a slight valley here. And again, in reality... Unless you have an older male, that's kind of hard to see. I've seen quite a bit of cadaver parts. I've yet to see one that's super prominent. But nevertheless, it's in Kramer and Bogduke, so we need to talk about it. Uh, typically, it's shaped like an L, as I just showed you, or some say a C. And the sacral auricular surface is half of the SI joint. The other half is the iliac auricular surface. Kind of said that already. <clears throat> Hope my voice can hold up here. So this is what is today? This is Tuesday. I'm Tuesday evening. I'm trying to do this. So uh, each has a pad of articular cartilage. We'll talk about the histology a little bit uh, more. But there's a pad. There's a facet. You could almost call it. It's articular cartilage, and we'll save that Highland word for a minute because histologists might disagree. 
but another weird thing about the SI joint is it has a capsule, just like this capsule around the zygopotheseal joints, or capsule around your knee, but it's incomplete in the back. Uh, so it's kind of a weird, it's a, not a true diarthroidal joint. It's, it's like a kind of odd diarthroidal joint because it has a synovial membrane. Synovial cells secrete synovial fluid. It's got that, but it's weird because it has no posterior capsule, as we'll see. It also has, it's innervated, and it has nociceptors. So it has the ability to feel pain, and patients can it can be a pain generator, and especially if it gets stuck, and you might have to manipulate that. Remember the rule of anomalies. If you see one, did I tell you the rule of anomalies? I think I did. If you see one weirdness, always look for another weirdness. Like the, remember we saw the little baby with the tail, the little monkey tail? And sure enough, it had a spina bifida manifesta. So do you see any anomaly here? Well, here is the auricular surface. Let me draw it. Got a little ocean wave background music for you, too. We still got my studio's not super soundproof, and maybe that'll drown out some of the kids going cuckoo out there. There's the auricular surface, but you're not supposed to have two auricular surfaces, right? So here's kind of a semi-rare situation. We got a specimen that's got a double SI joint. Where's the other weirdness? You can see spina bifida. This is our specimen. We talked about this before. So we'd actually have one of these fairly rare specimens. But the rule, you see one weirdness, look for another. And sure enough, there's some weirdness right there. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but it's a good spot to show you something else. So you would have a capsule here, like a membrane over this, and I guess it would go like this. But the weird thing about the capsule and the Z-joints, it would go all the way around the joint. Then you would have, you would have zillions of synovial cells here secreting fluid, so you would have fluid in here to make this slippery. But how's the fluid, how come it doesn't leak out the back? Well, out the back side, we have, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but we have the interosseous sacroiliac ligaments. You can't see them in the lab, but they're there, and they are, there's three of them. There's an upper band, or superior band, an uh, intermediate band, or middle band, and an inferior band. And these guys are very powerful ligaments. The, the, this is the sacroiliac joint, super powerful ligaments. You actually know one of the insertion points. You may not know. I don't know if you went over that in gross anatomy. But if we back up, this is where they insert. This is the uh, tuberosity of the ilium right here. And I think uh, you were given some bones, so you've been studying this a little bit. And so, yeah, so this is, this roughness of bone just shows the power of those ligaments. When you see rough areas, that's areas of high tugging, and it, the body responds by putting more calcium down there. Uh, so that's the deal with that. But that's where the interosseous, the other, the connection for the interosseous sacral iliac ligaments is right there. Okay, and same deal with this. There's no capsule back here. Either, but there is a capsule. The capsule comes down in front of this, making this a weird, weird type of joint. Okay, we're good with that. All right. Uh, oh, I guess I could have just done that. I'm not used to having a drawing tool. It's kind of fun to have the drawing tool here. Uh, but there they are again. So that is the auricular surface, but it's a weird double auricular surface. Now let's get into it. So there's auricular surface. We already said this has two elevations in a depression on the sacral auricular surface. Again, it may be subtle, hard to see, especially in females. Maybe it's the reason females have a little more motion sometimes. They may have three millimeters. Guys may have one millimeter. And this, the source of this is standring. This is Gray's Anatomy that thick. That's 2017, I believe. 
or 2016, not 2007. It's the new one I got this from. But this is a Board of Chiropractic Examiner's book. And so is your student Gray's Anatomy. They don't quite agree. They're probably 98% agree, but there are things they don't agree with. Which always drives professors crazy and students crazy as well. So let's dig into this. So we said we had an upper facet. Uh, that's the kind of the top hill. And then we have a middle region, which is a depression. Uh, sometimes it's just called a facet. Sometimes it's called a cranial facet or superior. But there's a lot of AKAs. Superior limb. Bok du calls it a superior arm. Um, superior articular facet. There's a lot of AKAs authors use for these things. I'm just going to call them the uh, the upper, middle, and lower facets would be a good one. Uh, the middle region. So it accepts a, a thing, a little mountain on the iliac auricular surface called Bonier's tubercle. Uh, that's actually the pivot point for nutational motion. Uh, and that's, this is the only thing where I can't show you, uh, but the pelvis can rock forward. I don't know how to show you unless I stuck maybe a little segment in here, which I just don't have time to do. Uh, but it's a pivot point. All right, and then we have the inferior facet down here. Uh, these are adjacent to the S2, S3 region. The superior facets are at the level of S1. All right, here they are again. All right, depression here. That's the depression of, you could call that the depression for Bonier's tubercle as well. Bonier's depression, you could call it. All right, uh, Bogduke says that there's, again, he calls them arms. There's a superior arm uh, and an inferior arm. Kramer uses the facet, if I remember right. Um, so you could certainly call them arms as well. I like Bogduke a lot, so maybe I'll call them arms on the test. Maybe I'll call them facets. You need to know both of those terms. There's Bonier's depression right here. Some fun facts about the sacral auricular surface. Embryologically speaking, these were made by costal elements, just like the bone bars we talked about last time. Uh, bone bars are between the posterior sacral foramen. Uh, they were also made by costal facets. Um, same deal here. Uh, occasionally, there's a third, uh, a third accessory articular facet, uh, which can be in here. The hills and valleys lock the SI joint together, but that gets very sticky with age and starts to calcify. It's not unusual for older people to have those SI joints completely fused. So keep that in mind when you're trying to adjust SI joint in someone old. It may not, it may be impossible to adjust it because it's fused together. You might break it and hurt the patient. So be careful of older people. Locking mechanism. So we already said rotational mo movement is a rocking motion of your of the pelvis it's if you the coxal bone rocks forward uh, that's nutational motion and the uh, yeah and that's what its job is that's the only type of motion it really has and back when i went to school it was we talked about you get a pi ilium in the psis rotates nutationally moves backwards maybe an inch or maybe a half an inch and that is certainly not true that's been proven over and over in fact the motion on average is about two millimeters or two degrees therefore you really it's difficult to detect unless you're on fluoroscopy or taking x-rays or ct or something uh, so just keep that in mind even though they're going to teach you pi and as and stuff the movement is really 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 tiny the center of nutational motion, we said already, is Bonier's tubercle. And that's located on the auricular surface of the ilium. I push it to put a star. I think I had that on my last test, and a lot of people missed that one. Bonier's tubercle fits in that middle depression in the sacral, uh, in the sacral auricular surface. Okay, SI joint is a weird joint. As I said, they have a joint capsule on the back. It's filled with synovial fluid, but there's no joint capsule around the posterior aspects. And we said instead there's an interosseous sacroiliac ligament back there 
that kind of acts as its posterior capsule, which is definitely weird. Um, let's see the SI joint, the joint plane. So another weird thing is the plane of the, the SI joint is about 30 degrees from the sagittal plane. Um, so therefore, but, but with that said, they're highly variable. Studies on these planes have shown that sometimes they're 45 degrees, sometimes they're 10 degrees. They can be all over the place. And maybe one's 10 degrees on one side and one's 45 on the other. So the, the planes of these joints can vary between people. That's why everybody, you want to adjust down the plane of these joints. Uh, some people may not have a 30 degree joint. And, or maybe it's easy to adjust them on one side, but you can't adjust them on the other. Why? Because maybe their plane's 50 degrees. And you're not going to adjust a joint if you're not thrusting down the plane of it. All right. Uh, so it makes the SI joint look weird because of this 30 degree plane on a and an x-ray it makes the SI joint look weird. An x-ray is like getting run over by a steamroller. You flatten you flat like a pancake on the ground and therefore everything is superimposed. The anterior part is superimposed on the posterior part and therefore your SI joint looks like this, right? There's the bigger post here, and there's the the anterior smaller. So it looks like a fracture, and it looks weird, doesn't it? Uh, I took these slides out because I'm getting too into the weeds, and I'll let them teach you in the upper quarters. But you can take an x-ray right down the plane of the joint where you, you'll have one nice slit. I'll show you a CT. If you look at it overhead, it's really easy to see the SI joint. There's also something we need it. I just no, actually noticed this on this person. We need to talk about this. Uh, so, and we'll clarify this for you, but remember we had superarticular processes of S1. Uh, they should be in a coronal plane. So they should look like pancakes here. You can't see one, on, you can't see the other one, but look at this side. See the slit right here? That's where the two joints are meeting. This is a sagittal facet. This is a coronal facet. This is a this is something called facet tropism. It greatly, well, I don't want to say greatly, but it can definitely increase the chances of people having low back pain, especially when they get older, because their biomechanics are messed up at this joint. Uh, one joint is going to be overloaded, and the other one's going to have life easy. Um, so watch out for that. You'll see these a lot in your office. We'll talk about them more here in a second. But right now, the on an A to P x-ray, the SI joints look really funky. But nevertheless, you can still see, you can still see this, there's no pathology, there's no whiteness, or there's no destruction of this joint. They look really smooth and like a road, right? Kind of like a road you can drive your Ant-Man, you could drive your little Ant-Man car right down there. All the way, no problem. We're going to show you where that doesn't happen. Here's a CT with a, a axial view, uh, or kind of you can think of it as an overhead view. It's really from underneath is the view, but it's easier to think of like a lumberjack sawing a tree and then looking down at the rings. Uh, so this is the chat, right? In radiology, you always call it an axial view. You don't call it a horizontal or a transverse or a cross section. It's always an axial in radiology. Um, but if I drop a sagittal line down, and we can measure the SI joint, and this one's about, I didn't get my tools on it, but that's pretty darn close to 30 degrees. And that's it. That's the SI joint right there. This is the body of L5. Looks like it's got spatulated transverse processes, too. We're going to get to that in a minute. All right, another concept. Uh, we talked about this already. Are these sacral fossa? No, I didn't talk about these. We talked about the auricular surface and its elevation, elevation, depression. But we talked about the interosseous sacroiliac ligament. And there's three holes back here where three massively strong fibers go. And those, of course, have a name. And those are called the sacral fossa. Okay, uh, sometimes there's only two. Uh, but there's usually three. And there's simply an upper, middle, and lower sacral fossa. That's where the interosseous sacroiliac ligaments arise. Is there an origin and insertion? Probably learning those like crazy for anatomy right now. Is there an origin and insertion for ligaments? No, you just say they arise from. There's no origin insertion because there's no muscle. 
uh, fiber in, in ligaments. Ligaments don't contract. Here's a nice cartoon. So they cut the sacroiliac joint, or they cut these interosseous sacroiliac ligaments, and they pushed the coxal bone forward, kind of butterflied the, the SI joint in order to show you where they live. Now, you won't see these on the cadaver specimens. There is a way. I used to pin them, but I won't get into that. But, you, well, I'll tell you, you can pin them right here. Uh, you can, when I mean pin, that's how we used to test you guys, to stick pins with numbers on it and test you. Uh, but there are some remnants here on the tuberosity, the elect tuberosity. So that's technically where you can or you could pin these, uh, these intraosseous sacroiliac ligaments. Uh, but here they are. So there's the superior sacral fossa, middle sacral fossa, inferior sacral fossa. Okay, note the absence of the, yeah, post. So here's that same view, uh, overhead view, only we're looking like that we saw on the CT, but this is posteriorly, this is anteriorly, and this is the SI joint. It's a skinny little thing. You adjust back here in the PSIS, but the actual joint, which has synovial fluid, is right here. Here's the real capsule. There's the anterior sacroiliac ligament. I think we'll get to that next lecture. I kind of pull all the ligaments out and want to do them uh, kind of by themselves. Uh, but there's a capsule. Over that, there's an anterior sacroiliac ligament, which I didn't put in here. Um, but yeah, so that's the interosseous sacroiliac ligament in the back here. And yeah, awesome. That's about all I need to say about that. Or groovy, like we used to say back in my day. Nobody says groovy anymore, I don't think. Uh, let's see. So this is the iliac tuberosity. Yep, we already drew this stuff for you. And this is where the three interosseous sacroiliac ligaments connect, right here. Greater sciatic knots right here. Always want to know what comes out of those notches, right? Greater sciatic, lesser sciatic is here. I won't, that's anatomy's territory. I'll let them handle that. Here's a cadaver specimen. This is not our cadaver, by the way. This is just from YouTube or just on the online. Kind of L-shaped, auricular surface, interosseous sacroiliac ligaments are back here. All right. Well, we said there's no scepters in the SI joint because it certainly can be a source of chronic pain. In fact, I have a client I'm talking to this weekend who had a failed sacroiliac fusion. Uh, so, yeah, it can definitely be a source of pain, in the, and we'll see if they did all the work right. Make sure it's not coming because the a disc, an annular tear within a disc, can refer pain to the SI joint. So you have to be really careful with that SI joint, as we'll as see in a minute. But anyway, uh, not really great quality research on the innervation of the sacroiliac joint. In fact, they don't agree. Uh, Bogduk scolds everybody and says the work is conflicting. The stand ring says, yeah, the source of ramification, which means what nerves plug into it, fancy way to say that, remains uncertain. N nice way of scolding them. We need to do more work on that. And the innervation may be different on one, the left side. Maybe the left is supplied by L4, 5, and S1, and the right is supplied by L5, S1, and S2. So it can vary between person and person. Um, nevertheless, there are nerve fibers uh, that innervate the capsule, and we'll see how that works in a second. So here's the second is up. So here's what we think right now. Posterior part of the joint and the anterior part of the joint, and this is from Bogduke, who's the kind of the god of the lumbar spine anatomy. Uh, so if all the research says that they're same innervation. So the posterior sacroiliac joint is innervated by L5, S1, and S2. Oh, really common nerves to be inflamed from a herniated disc, right? Uh, and the anterior rami also supplies the anterior part of the joint. So, yeah, that'd be nice if that was true, at least uh, that wouldn't be so widely innervated. But this is probably why if you injure your L5 nerve root from a disc herniation or your S1 nerve root, it refers pain so darn often to the SI joint. 
Uh, and when I had my herniation, I got faked out. Even I got faked out. This is a long time ago. Uh, but I, God, it was my pain was right in my SI joint. I had no idea that my disc was torn to pieces, my S1 disc. So I can I can attest personally. I bet the research uh, clearly says that it refers pain. We'll see about referred pain. Uh, why do we care if it's innervated? But of course, innervation carries the sense of pain. And what do I mean by innervation? It's innervated. That means pain nerve fibers are plugged into the thing. Uh, modern research shows that the sacroiliac joint can be a source of chronic back pain. It's actually third place by far. People your age, the number one cause, and I'm not talking about a sprained muscle, you lifted something, or sprained ligament. I'm talking about chronic pain that's been there for f more than four months. Number one cause is a tear within the intervertebral disc, a disc tear. And may be herniated, it may not be herniated. Number two cause is an injury to the facet joint. So you've injured the articular cartilage within your uh, within your facet joint. That's our bread and butter, right, the facet. We, we can treat the disc too. We have flexion distraction treatments. And third place, maybe around 8% of the time, unlike Kramer, who used really old research, like 50% of the time he said that's ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, SI dysfunction uh, can... It, it's a source of referral uh, from those other structures. But the SI joint, in fact, all three, the SI joint, the annulus fibrosus, sinovertebral nerves, and the SI joint, and even the hip joint, they can all refer pain, usually to the anterior lateral part of the thigh. Some people might be more to the lateral posterior part. Some people may be the anterior medial. You, people will come in with just burning pain on the thigh. It can be really tough to figure out what the injury is. In fact, what can refer pain to the anterior lateral thigh? SI joints, an injury to those. L4 or L5 annular tear, whether or not it's herniated or not. Uh, L4-5 and an L5-S1 facet joint disease. You injured a sprain to facet joint, and now you've damaged the facet joint. Uh, or femoral acetabular joint disease, that's a fancy way to say hip, right? Femoral acetabular. So there's four things that can refer pain. That's an easy question for me, right? What's the job of the sacrum? Uh, well, its job is to carry the axial load of the body. So axial load is a downward force pushing straight down on the sacrum, and that's the job. It receives the axial load, but where does it transmit it to? Down to the coccyx? And what good is that going to do? You need to transfer it to the earth. And so it does 90 degree turn, goes through the sacroiliac joints, and then through the coxal bone, and then through, you can draw the femur in here, through the femurs, we'll say this femur's weird, it goes all the way to the foot. Um, so yeah, so the force goes like this to the ground. And then of course you have, for every force, there's an opposite force, so you also have a force coming from the ground the same direction, going the opposite way. But it receives axial load is the deal with it. Ultimately transfers it to the sacrum, uh, transmits, this is the job of the sacrum, it transmits that axial load horizontally, and you can see people with osteoporosis, you can see horizontal fractures and overload injuries. I used to go down the rabbit hole, I took those slides out, and let them teach you that later on. Um, but yeah, so it passes them horizontally uh, through the SI joints. Coxal bones then distribute force down the lower extremities, just as I said. The third job it also transfers force upward, that opposite, what is it, one of Newton's laws, my physics is a long time ago, but there's an opposite force being transferred right through there. So in this little 3D reconstruction, you can see, job, it transfers the axial load this way, and then the force of ground transfers load up this way. Okay. Does the, oh, there's a nice, uh, did we saw that, I think, before, didn't we? 
Look at that nice sacrohitis there in this. Is that one level or two level? Two level. Is two level more common or one level? Spina bifida creating the sacrohitis. Two levels is slightly more. Was it 40 something, 43%, something like that? Sacralized as well. Did we talk about that? I think we already talked about lumbarization and sacralization. This one's sacralized, big spatulated L5 transverse processes. Does the SI joint really have a function? Oh, this is a fighting. Researchers will fight over this word. Some authors are vehement that it has virtually no function other than to transfer axial load. Other law authors believe, no, it's a semi-true diarthroidal joint, so it's it's a real joint, just like it's a true diarthroidal joint. And Bogduke, again, the god of the lumbar spine, gross anatomy and functional anatomy, and written, I don't know how many books he's written, but he's very well respected. That's, we don't have many MDs listed as Board of Chiropractic Examiner books, but he's one of them because he is an MD. Um, yeah, so here's what Bogduke says. So now he goes, despite the size, the SI joint cannot be considered a major joint. Why? Because it's got some weirdness. Unlike most joints, its range of motion is very small. It's two degrees on average it moves. The only way it moves is nutationally. And unlike most joints, it doesn't have any muscle, right? Like your elbow's got muscle crossing it, and muscles can act on it. But what? tell me what muscle can move the SI joint. There's no muscle that crosses that joint. So Bogdick says it is definitely a joint, but it's... It's more a good example would be the intertarsal joints of the foot. Uh, so they don't have any active movement, but nevertheless they can passively move. You can you can move them by pushing on them. Um, so that's what Bogduk has to say about that. So they're like um, yeah, like these intertarsal joints, and you've already studied this. I think you've, you're down this far, uh, but yeah, here's a nice nice skeleton here. And there's intertarsal joints, right? There's the cuboid, and the cuboid connects to, well, you tell me who it connects to. Lateral cuneiform, right? That's an intertarsal joint. And then the lateral and medial cuneiform, there's another intertarsal joint. Not These are transverse tarsal joints across here, right? And across here. Uh, but these are intertarsal joints here. So, yeah, that's the same type of joint as the SI joint. And why else is it weird? We already talked about this. It has no posterior joint capsule. What kind of a joint has no joint capsule? We'll talk another one. There's one in the cervical spine called the joints of von Luschka. That's weird. It has no anterior joint capsule. This one has no posterior joint capsule. So that's that's weird. Um, yeah. So no no joint capsule has ever been. He's a, he's dissected probably thousands of cadavers. Nobody's ever found one. Uh, so that's really strange. Uh, the joint capsule around this, the articular auricular surfaces and the ilium are only developed anterior and laterally. Uh, but the interosseous sacroiliac ligaments, they act as they makeshift posterior capsules we already said. Right? And so if I, if I drew those ligaments in, I mean they would be all filling in here, all connected together. So that kind of acts as its posterior capsule because there's there's fluid in here, right? There's all kinds of synovial fluid keeping that joint slippery. How is the joint classified officially? Kramer and Bogduke are on the same page. It's classified as an atypical diarthroidal joint. I don't know what that IFY is in there. That's my voice recognition software playing tricks. Um, why is it atypical? We already talked about it. Cont uh, it contains, it doesn't have a full joint capsule. right? Or it's typical because it does have at least some joint capsule and it has a synovium, synovium fluid. Why is it atypical? That'd be a good question. Board multiple choice questions have four answers, four choices, not five. Perfect question, right? Um, all of the following are atypical, or 
or oddities of the sacroiliac joint except blank. It's an example of a board. It's not a real, I just made it off the top of my head, but that's how they would go. It has very little movement between its surfaces, right? Only a couple millimeters. That's weird. What if the joint has a couple millimeters of movement, yet has a synovium? Now you're thinking your symphys pubis, but that doesn't have a synovial membrane between it. So really weird. It doesn't have any muscle that can move it. There's no muscles that, that connect on each side of it and move the thing. Um, and it's only the half a joint capsule deal. So that's that's the oddities of this thing. Histology is weird too, uh, quite unusual. So the sacral auricular surface, if you get down and look at it with a microscope, it's made of hyaline cartilage. But the auricular surface is made of a fibro, super tough fibro cartilage. So what's the deal with that? Now, this is a close call. It's not pure, if you want to get technical, it's not pure fibro cartilage. It's got some highland characteristics in it. But nevertheless, most authors will say there is a difference here. Any weirdness, good board questions, good my questions, but it's a close call on that. Highland cartilage is really good at transmitting forces, the axial load coming down from the body. Fibro cartilage is better at receiving forces, according to Bogue Duke. So that's why the committee designed it that way. Uh, what about degeneration? Now we're going to get, you guys will probably like this stuff. Some uh, It can degenerate. In fact, it is very, its degeneration pattern is really predictable. So all human SI joints go through a really predictable degeneration with time. In fact, as we said, by the time people get old, the degeneration is so bad, they've lost uh, two degrees of motion is long gone. They may be completely ossified together. And sometimes that happens before the age of 50, right? Completely ossified together sometimes. Uh, this type of degeneration is typically not associated with chronic pain. It's just part of, part of aging. And there's a pathologist. In fact, the aging of uh, the sacroiliac joint is so predictable. These forensic sci scientists, they will use the amount of degeneration per to fairly accurately predict the age of the human. Now the fun part, sacroiliac. Let's talk about some disorders here. Uh, so there's a bunch of them. Let's go through what can go wrong Someone comes in, they got pain in the SI joint. Uh, you've done studies and there's no disc herniation. The MRI looks beautiful. There's no degeneration. Facet joints look great. This is a real SI joint problem. What can go wrong with it? Well, you can have pathological degeneration. People can have osteoarthritis in their SI joint. Uh, wear and tear arthritis, a lot of AKAs, arthritis, degenerative arthritis, OA. Uh, they've worn the joint out. How can you wear out your joint? Well, you, I bet every single one of you knows someone who's had a knee replacement. What happened to that knee? It was good at one time when they were a little kid. It wore out. How did they wear it out? Well, maybe one of them was a elite athlete. College-level athlete. Athletics is enough to do it. Prematurely wear out a joint, and, and there you go. But maybe some people weren't college athletes. Why do their knees wear out? Well, it's genetics. The, the genes that make some of the collagen and fiber cartilage, they're just not very good, and they make a substandard type, and it wears out, and you're bone on bone. Same thing can happen in your SI joints. Gene mutations or abuse of the joint can do it. And all of these things can result in chronic, uh, chronic pain, chronic SI joint pain. Uh, let's see. So what do we have here? Besides somebody looks a little osteopenic, a little decreased bone density. Well, there's that weird kind of double SI joint thing. It's a A to P x-ray. I don't see any extra white. When you have stress on a joint, you won't see. Ant-Man can drive on this road, right? Ant-Man can drive right down there. We can all see my little, there's the Ant-Man car in red. Right? Same thing here. So I don't see any problem here. These are gas bubbles here. You'll learn about that as time goes on. There's some uh, fecal material right there inside a gas bubble. So yeah, good looking SI joint. What do you think of this one? Can Ant-Man drive his car in this one? Oh boy, it's a bumpy road, isn't it? It's back and forth. And see all the extra white in here? 
This is no good. This is a degenerated SI joint. Ant-Man can barely get his car through here. So this joint is really beat up from something. Um, and yeah, so that's moderate to severe osteoarthritis of the, of the SI joint. Turns out that he had a fractured both SI joints a long time ago uh, in a skein injury, and that screwed up the biomechanics, and they wore out really early. There's a close-up of that. What about pain from the SI joint? So pain, where we said pain can refer to the posterior lateral thigh or even the an or anterior lateral thigh or posterior lateral thigh. Uh, most of the time they're going to have pain right over the SI joint, though. But again, annular tears. Uh, annular tears can also refer pain. They're notorious for referring pain and set facet an injury of this Z joint right here. Right, you get an inflammation in there, it can refer pain. Just like when you get a heart attack, where you've seen that in the movies, where's the pain go? It really does. It goes down the left arm. What's the left arm got to do? It's just a common the brain gets confused, it gets confused where this visceral type pain is coming from. Uh, but yeah, so it can refer pain there, but it, it can also refer pain over the top where it's supposed to. Causes of pathological degeneration, so bad genetics we talked about. Uh, someone, a lead athlete, or maybe they're a dock worker or whatever, they beat up their joint and they wore it out. Joints, they're not indestructible. You can wear them out prematurely. Maybe they don't have, they have crummy biomechanics, short legs. And I'm not talking about tiny, everybody's legs are not perfect, but someone who's got a three quarters of an inch shorter leg on the right, you give that person a heel lift and make them wear that heel lift, you could probably save them grief as they get older because short legs can definitely wear out an SI joint. So can stepping in a hole, like not realizing it. Um, sometimes we don't know what causes it. It just degenerates. Uh, sacroiliac trauma, the skiing accident, we talked about that. So what else? Well, trauma um, can do it flat out really quickly. So an axial load, if you fall on your butt, that's an axial load type injury uh, that can injure the SI joint. Uh, if you're broadsided, a car accident, if you're hit from the passenger side or your door was hit, that's a broadside or a T-bone that can be called. Uh, notorious for really injuring the SI joint. Stepping in a pothole in the dark where you don't see the pothole uh, puts an uneven axial load in there that can flare that thing up and damage the cartilage. What about pregnancy? Sure, pregnancy is pretty darn hard on the SI joint. Uh, you have hormones flowing that start relaxing the ligaments. That pubic symphysis has to relax and open your pelvis up. And those hormones also open up the SI joints. And um, that can be damaging. They're susceptible to lower force injury. Even at birth, my daughter, her SI joints dislocated them, uh, her last, her third birth. And it took about a year. She's better now, but she was sore for a long time from that. Uh, part tuition, add for your vocabulary list. That's the act of giving birth. Uh, so you can overstretch, and, and maybe you didn't have enough relaxing. Maybe you have a small pelvis, and you overstretch the SI joints and you damage them from that or just having that 30 to 60 pound extra weight around your belly carrying that around uh, that can wear them out as well oh the old inflammatory diseases i like these i like to test on these uh, so inflammation can also an inflammatory disease inflammation in the body can be a really good thing but it tends to just go way overboard. That's why people have to take anti-inflammatories because it goes way overboard, way above and beyond. And it starts to, because uh, we need inflammation to clean up the dead tissue. Uh, like someone had a heart attack, you need an inflammation to clean up the dead myocardial tissue. But some people, the inflammation cleanup is so bad, it spills over into the pericardium and they get pericarditis from that. Inflammation starts attacking their pericardium, the sac around their heart. So it it's, it's, goes too much. It's too crazy sometimes. Uh, but yeah, so there are some autoimmune type diseases and some inflammatory diseases we need to talk about. And they all fit into a, one category uh, called the seronegative spondyloarthropathy group. 
Uh, zero means their blood serum tested negative uh, for rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid factor is often present. But this group, rheumatoid factor, is not present. But another famous inflammatory marker, HLA-B27, is positive. All right, you might as well get that in your brain. You're going to use this for the rest of your life. This is good knowledge. So seronegative spinal arthropathies uh, that affect the SI joint. So all these conditions can inflame the other regions of the axial skeleton, including the SI joint. So again, patients will have the HLA-B27 antibody on their MHC cells and... Dr. Doe will explain what an MHC cell is, but let's meet them. You have to memorize this list, and there's mnemonics. You can make up your own. You need to know this list, and you might as well do it now. So ankylosing spondylitis, most common uh, of all the seronegative spinal arthropathies. Um, probably every other month I'll have a client who has this. It's really, really quite common. Or not? It's not super common, but, I mean, you'll run into this for sure. Uh, when you, uh, when you, as your practice develops, uh, loves the SI joints. If there's an inflammation in the SI joints, the first thing you think of is the ankylosing spondylitis. Psoriatic, Phil Mickelson, the golfer, this is his disease, psoriatic arthritis. A uh, certain percentage of people also have psoriasis on their skin. I think 30% of people with psoriasis, I teach dermatology too, right? 30% uh, of people with psoriasis actually end up getting psoriatic arthritis as well. Uh, we have the inflammatory bowel disease we'll talk about in fifth quarter, but Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, some of them are associated with extra intestinal manifestation. So not only do they have an inflammation of their small bowel and colon, androcolon, but they have their joints, their fingers are inflamed, their SI joints are inflamed. It attacks other regions as well. well. Talk about that more in fifth quarter. Writer's syndrome. They're trying to, well, that's how I always learned it. Pencil in a cup, right? And you get you know, other people who are more advanced. Won't worry about that. But I think writer, pencil in a cup, erosion of the phalanges. But they're trying to call it reactive arthritis now. So I think that's the new word. But you're going to have to know that, AK. And these are not as common Whipple's disease and Beckett's disease. But those are the serospondylo, uh, seronegative spondylo arthropathies. All right, uh, there, the Journal of Rheumatology always put out a really nice little eye pain. It's a good way to remember the kind of clinical presentation of these conditions, and they can vary from this, but on average, these patients, there's no, they didn't have a car accident, they didn't have a slip and fall. All of a sudden, their low back started hurting, or their SI joints, because this can affect your Z joints as well. So an insidious onset is always always puzzling. Um, but then they have pain at night. It often wakes them up, and, or morning pain. Get up in the morning, they feel terrible. But as the day goes and they get kind of warmed up, they feel better. Uh, and that can be regular arthritis too. But uh, the age, you, here's the difference between regular arthritis and the seronegative spinal arthropathies. The age of onset is maybe in the 20s. It's under 40. The arthritis patients, those people are up in their 60s or so uh, on average. Uh, and it proves with exercise, that's the same as getting up and doing things. Uh, and you rest at night, they dread going to sleep because it doesn't get better with pain. Arthritis usually feels better when you rest and get off the joint. So uh, eye pain, that's the eye pain mnemonic. Okay, let's do a case. I like these little cases. 32-year-old, pretty young, right? 32-year-old male comes in, six-month six history of progressive stiffness of the spine. He's a stiff, he can't bend like he used to. He's only 32, he feels like he's old. Uh, he has night pain and morning pain, but as the day goes by, he seems to loosen up and do better. He has a sore back. You order some blood work. Comes back negative for RH factor, but positive for HLB27. So your brain goes, ah, what's the first thing you think of? Ankylosing spondylitis, but it could be Writer's syndrome, it could be all the other list. Take radiographs. What do you see? Can Ant-Man drive the car? Now you're Ant-Man driving your car. No, <laughs> right? 
it's all sclerotic. That's all osteoblastic activity. There's an inflammation that stimulated osteoblasts to lay down bone. This is destroyed. The joint is destroyed. Ant-Man can drive a little bit here, but not very far. This is destroyed as well, but not as bad as here. Uh, so, yeah, so this is turned out to be uh, ankylosing spondylitis, AS. I blew that up for you. You can see Ant-Man can start. Well, that's it. Ant-Man can't go any farther because this joint is obliterated. So ankylosing spondylitis. Here's a client I had, when was that, last year? 72-year-old, uh, low back pain, really bad scoliosis. Um, so I was, we were talking about that and if you should get another surgery or what to do about that. Uh, he didn't even know he had this. Uh, so he, I had a son for lab work and I saw this. So we haven't talked about the ligaments, but there's a posterior longitudinal ligament that goes. You should never be able to see that on x-ray or CAT scan. They're the same, any type of radiology. And he's got a flowing calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. Sure enough, lab work comes back, HLA-B27 positive, RH negative. He's got ankylosing spondylitis. So that on top of a failed fusion. Uh, so this guy is definitely a mess. So this has a word that's called bamboo spine bamboo spine. Why bamboo spine? Because your spine is stiff. You're like bamboo. You can't uh, you can't bend. And you got to watch out up on the cervical spine to make sure the posterior longitudinal ligament, it didn't, it didn't thicken here, but up in the cervical spine, if your posterior longitudinal ligament thinks you can injure your spinal cord, you can squish your spinal cord, get myelopathy. Uh, infection. So back to what's causing pain. Not super, super common cause, but maybe it's an infection. People with tuberculosis, that those bugs like to travel, and they love the SI joint. They can get in the SI joint and rip that thing up, causing inflammation. They get in there, and the body sees the bugs and attacks, and now you got a battle. And who's the casualty of the battle is the tissue, the structure of the SI joints destroyed. Uh, pay people with endocarditis, which is a bug infection, often staph, infection of the heart it can spill break loose and end up in the SI joints oh this is a good one uh, and this is uh, Murkami is actually listed this so subluxation fixation uh, so if an SI joint so this is now this is us right we fix fixations we get joints moving again so if if an SI joint gets fixated and doesn't have that two millimeters of movement uh, there's research on this. It can overwork the interosteosacroiliac ligaments, get overworked to the point. It's like someone playing tennis and gets an inflammation in their elbow, tennis elbow. Uh, the SI joints can do that. You can get a chronic inflammation because you're fixated at that joint. Uh, so good. that's a good one for chiropractors. Uh, you might see some osteophytosis in there. Um, yeah, but... They even, this is uh, from um, Murakami again, 2018. So I was happy to see this in here. Uh, so there's the SI joint, right? That same view we looked at. There's the massive interosseous sacral ligament. And yeah, if this rely, for biomechanics to work, there's got to be some, that two millimeters of movement is important. It's got to be some movement in here. So this, it takes some of the load off this joint. If you fuse that joint, this thing's going to get pounded. And here's an example of it's all wide and inflamed. Uh, be, why? Because of a simple fixation here. All right. More things that can cause gout. We always think of gout affects the uh, metatarsophalangeal joint, right? Classic gout there. Uric acid crystals in there. Problem with uric acid metabolism. Can't eat red meat. Uh, kidney stones, uric acid stones. But anyway, this is not the only joint that those uric acid crystals can go in. They can deposit in the SI joint, so patient could have some of these metabolic conditions of the SI joint, like gout or hyperparathyroidism. Could hopefully, this will never happen to you, hopefully, um, but they could get cancer in that joint. Uh, most likely a metastatic spread, maybe from the prostate. Uh, but you could get cancer cells start start multiplying in there, and you can get an infl inflammation because of that cancer. And you can get, that could cause sacroiliac pain. 
metastatic disease. You could get a tumor. I guess this is what it's saying. It could be a lipoma. You could get some tumorous growth in there, which messes up the biomechanics and causes inflammation. Notice how many times I keep saying inflammation. Inflammation is the root of all evil. We need a little bit of it, but not too much. Okay, Kramer, you need to look at this slide and update your book, in my humble opinion. Uh, so SI Bone, let's talk about SI Bone. So that's a medical device company, and they're not called SI Bone for nothing. They specialize in making surgical fusion equipment for the SI joint. Uh, and so they have a lot of money. They have other businesses too. Uh, so maybe the last 15 years, they have poured tons of research dollars, funded their own study. So you got to be careful when they're the sponsor of a study, right? Because the researchers want that grant money or that, that funding money to keep coming in. So they have a job. Uh, so they they tend to kind of favor the SI bone. So they were getting uh, some papers saying 25% of all chronic back pain. Kramer said 50%. That's ridiculous. Not even the man, not even SI Bone said it was that high. Uh, so that's just, maybe it was even a typo in his book. So I don't know. I'll have to talk to him if I see him uh, in July, which I will probably see him if, unless it gets canceled because of this corona thing. We had our, I was on the test writing committee again, and he's going again, but we it got canceled because of the corona outbreak, rescheduled for July. Anyway, I'm getting digressed. So even, I think that's ridiculous, 25%. In my clinical experience, I never see, I rarely see SI joint problems. That's a tough joint, unless they have AS or some inflammatory disease. So here's what the modern research says about this. Uh, Murakami, 11%, a little older research, 2002. They still think it's a little high. Um, then we have a little older, Newton, 10% in his study, the prevalence of chronic SI pain. And they did this by blocking, injecting lidocaine into the joint. If the SI joint is a source of pain and you eject lidocaine into it, better, it should go away, right? And that's how they, they do it. Uh, and here's a brand new one. Um, so this is uh, DeFilippo. I'm not familiar with him, DeFilippo. But he was actually with my old boss, uh, Stephen Philippon Research Institute, was involved with this study. And this is more what I expected, uh, about 5% of people. So I completely agree based on my clinical experience. Uh, but I'll live with about 8%, maybe 10% if you want to round it off. But SI joint problems as a source of chronic pain, not that common. Also, we already talked about this, but the SI joint dysfunction is in third place. Uh, when it comes to the most common causes of chronic pain, we'll define it as pain over six months. Probably pain over four months would work, but we'll go six. Uh, annular tear in the disc with or without herniation, number one. Facet joint dysfunction, number two. SI joint, number three. All right, I was just wondering. It seems like we're getting going on too much. Um, but yeah, lumbar spine, so we'll hang it up here. I might actually throw some more SI ligaments in here next time, but... All right, so I forgot to start my recording, so let's all keep our fingers crossed that Camtasia doesn't drop this. All right, see you in the next video.